Hello, welcome back to another episode of Zero to Sixty. Now this is this is new territory for me. I've never done anything like this. But before I talk about today's video, let's talk about the last one I filmed, which was stripping down my old 17T engine. Now this engine lost co lost compression or lost a little bit of compression on cylinder four. Unfortunately, when I was doing the strip down video, we've had torrential floods, rain. It's just been a horrible two weeks for us around this area. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on off camera. It looks like we're going to have to move out of this place within the next two months, which kind of sucks. It was very un unexpected, but hey, it is life and we will work through it. Um, but yeah, I, I just wasn't paying enough attention. I was also talking to Woody when I was doing that video, Woody from the Skid Factory. Um, you might have seen him in the time lapse. So I just wasn't paying enough attention. I'd managed to get the engine mixed up front to back and then it was just... I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Anyway, luckily you guys spotted it and I didn't even notice it when I was doing the edit. Cylinder four is the piston that had the crack ring land. Actually, just so everybody knows, we've got cylinder one to cylinder six, cylinder one to cylinder six, cylinder four, Hopefully you can just see it there, cracked ring land. Now, I was kind of stressed when I filmed that video and even when I was editing it, I was sort of worried like, what's actually wrong with this engine? Because if I can't work out why it lost compression on cylinder four, there's no point progressing with this stage of the build. And we really needed to do that. Uh, I didn't want to have to pull the other engine out of the Flowmax car and start working on that one because we just, we just run out of space. Um, however, as soon as somebody pointed it out, and I can't remember the gentleman, I did pin his comment, but as soon as you actually pointed out that I'd got my cylinder order mixed up in the video, Man, I think I'd fell, fallen asleep within 10 minutes of reading that comment. I was so stressed about it. I'm glad that we found the problem with that. Very, very happy about that. Anyway, moving on. Right. The idea of this build was a budget build. Now, we're not trying to build the fastest or the best or the most powerful M54 in the world. We're just trying to make them a little bit stronger than a standard one. We've gone really fast with standard motors. I really was a standard motor. My 17T car is currently a standard motor. And we... We went quite fast in the Flowmax car before I was a bit of a dickhead and forgot that we might blow the engine up with the way I was driving it. Just to clarify as well, the way, the reason the motor in the Flowmax car blew up, I was trying to hurt the transmission. We were roll racing, I knew the transmission was bad, I was trying to see what I could put the transmission through for a race, and unfortunately I wasn't thinking about the engine. I was driving that car really badly, where normally I, I'm aware of sort of not I've normally got quite good mechanical sympathy with the engines. However, that race where I raced uh, Corn Fed Boost in his Commodore, I was brake boosting hard from like 12 to 1300 RPM in third gear. And as we sort of got up speed around the corner, I think we were making like nearly 20 PSI under 2000 RPM. It was just, it was a really bad way to drive the car. And obviously that much boost at such low an RPM, we had some pretty crazy timing in the car for the race. And uh, well, you can see how fast the car took off. But um, yeah, unfortunately that was just really bad. Too much boost, too low RPM, we damaged the motor. Well, I damaged the motor, my bad. Anyway, because of the GoFundMe, it's allowed us to sort of experiment with this budget type of build. Now, like I said, we're only trying to get it a little bit stronger than a standard motor. And what I'm working on with the way I'm gonna assemble this is like it's a standard engine. So a lot of you guys won't, well, I might not know, but I've been in the automotive industry my entire life. Car yards, wrecking yards. In the early days, our car yard was next to a mechanic. And when there was no customers to talk to, I'd just go and hang out with the mechanic. So I've watched a lot of engines be built. And not be built by a race team, but be built for the real world and how mechanics will actually put them together. Um, of course, this is like 20 years ago. Things weren't quite made to the same tolerances of these sort of BMW engines. But still... I learn a lot about how engines go together, how things work, what components are expected to do, head gaskets, pistons, whatever, um, and, and how you can sort of get around repairing them. <laughs> um, so I, what, what I've sort of come to the conclusion of doing with this build, to try and keep the price down, is to do it the way, a sort of a blend of what the guys were doing 15, 20 years ago. And I've got mates that work at BMW now, I know quite a lot of BMW techs, and I've spoken to them about how they put the engines together that come in for warranty that need a piston or whatever. Um, and we, I'm sort of using a blend of everything to put this together. I know it's not the right way to do it, so please don't have a panic attack if you think I'm, I'm missing a step. I have spoken to a lot of people with a lot of experience to come to this conclusion. I don't know it's gonna work. I don't know anyone that's put a forged engine together this way, but I know of a lot of second-hand engines that have been repaired this way with less balanced pistons and rods and all that sort of stuff, and they work fine. So let's just see what happens. If this works, this is gonna be a really, really good way for people to have a stronger engine and put it together themselves at home pretty damn cheaply. The catch is, it might not work. So we'll see how we go. Um, now. 
where do we start? Where do we start? Yesterday, this is the first, this could be the first car engine that I've completely put together myself. Um, I've never done ring gaps before. We've built a lot of motorbike engines when we had our bike shop. We used to have a motorbike race team as well. We were making like 75 horsepower on a single cylinder four stroke. Um, those were serious engines and we never did ring gaps on them. We used to just throw them together and they'd work fine for a little while. Um, so yeah, basically, I did a lot of this yesterday because I wanted to learn, get a feel for using a ring grinder and just putting it all together. Yesterday I did, I worked out all the weights, I'm going to show you the weights shortly, but I worked out how to, which rods I wanted to pair with which pistons, the rings and everything to try and balance and get close to matching the factory weights. Just here, uh, these are the rods and pistons with no rod bearing weights. In fact, cylinder one, let's just double check it. So I've got cylinder one, turn that on. We have cylinder one. Piston and rod, and the rod cap, it has still got the rod bearings in there. We can see it's 1,048 grams. Yes, I know my scales only go to a gram. I couldn't get anything more accurate this week. I tried. I tried. I went to so many scale shops. I couldn't get anything more accurate. So we're just going to work on that. Like, And you'll see why I'm not too fussed about it in a second. So you can see cylinder one, 1,048 grams. I went through and I weighed everything three times. So zero the scale, weighed it, zeroed it, weighed it. And these were the numbers that I'm going to leave with. And to be honest, every time I did it, it was the same number. But cylinder one is 1,048. Cylinder two was 1,043 grams. So that's a five gram difference between this bank and this bank, which is substantial. Uh, cylinder three was 1,047. Cylinder four was 1,044. Cylinder five, 1,048. And cylinder six was 1,048. Now that engine, I drove that car for about 20, uh, maybe 10 or 15,000 Ks. And obviously we've got quite a large variance of weights on each crank journal and the motor felt fine. It didn't wobble, it didn't, have any vibrations it was a good feeling engine until the water pump died um something else to keep in mind when people are putting standard engines together they just put them together they don't go and grind pistons and get them to the exact gram like you do when you're building a high performance engine or like what you've seen people do on youtube the reality is when it's a mechanic put an engine together they just put them together and they normally work fine and this is sort of a showcase for that so we've got a five gram variance between the rod and piston setup and the motor's fine Keep that in mind when you see me moving forward from this point. So yesterday I then went and weighed every one of the max speeding rods, every one of the AMP 44 pistons, and where's our information? So AMPs, the piston and wrist pin, every single one was 413 grams. So these were balanced pretty damn well. Now the max speeding rods, max speeding rods are advertised to be balanced within one gram of each other. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Uh, rods, the way that we originally had them laid out, one through to six, most of them were 543, apart from rod five was 544 and rod six was 545. So that is actually a two gram variance. Now you've got to keep in mind, this isn't going to a 10th of a gram. So that could only be a 1.6 gram variance and this thing's rounding up. Just keep it in mind, we're just gonna roll with it. Let's just get this thing put together. Um, what I ended up doing was pairing Basically, what I wanted to do was get the rods and the pistons together, and then I weigh them all again. And we did some shuffling. And I can't remember where my final weights were. Okay, yes, so I did some shuffling, also weighed the piston rings and that sort of stuff. And we've ended up with the assemblies as they are here. Actually, this is without the piston rings, but basically cylinder one, I wanted to have as a heavier one. That's because the original rods, Cylinder one was heavy, and all of these, are like two through to four, are pretty, well, 43, 47, and 44 grams, so not overly heavy, and then cylinder five and six was a heavier one. My thinking there was, just in case the crank is balanced a certain way to suit this setup from the factory, I don't think it is. Uh, Jake is currently going through an N54 engine build as well. He's doing it properly. Uh, he's now spent, I think, well over 10 grand doing his engine. Um, and he's still using max speeding rods and his pistons are only a couple of hundred dollars more, but he's gone to a machine shop. He's got everything bored, weighed, balanced. He's doing it properly. Uh, the machine shop actually balanced his crank and said it was within a gram on every lobe or every journal, whatever it's called. So they are actually balanced quite well from the factory, especially for a, like a non M engine. The N54 is well balanced, but just in case some of that balancing is coming from the weight that's on the piston and the rods, that's the way I'm gonna do this. So I, my intention was put the heavier rod on cylinder one or the heavier one of these, cylinder one and cylinder six, 
and try and replicate the original weights a little bit. Now, I could have started to take away piston material, which is what happened with Jake's setup at the machine shop. They did file away a bit of piston material to get all of these within a gram of each other. The way that they've ended up, da, 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 they are all within two grams. So, yeah, basically, I'm just making sure because I was doing all this yesterday. Cylinder one through to cylinder six. Now this is just the rod, the wrist pin, sorry, the rod, the wrist pin and the piston, not with the rings on them, but it was 957 through to 957, 955, 956, 956, 956, 957 grams. So we're pretty sort of heavy piston and basically the heavy setup at piston one and piston six. I hope that makes sense. I hope you're following along. I could have spent another, I don't know, probably an hour getting them all the same but I kind of want to just put it together and see how it goes. Nobody seems to document doing things the way that I've seen it happen so much in the real world. Everyone is so concerned with YouTube and getting criticized for doing stuff. If they don't do it like by the book, to the, to the decimal point of everything, you get torn apart on YouTube. And I think it really impacts the way a lot of people think about mechanical work. And from what I've seen in the real world, selling thousands of cars, watching tens of thousands of cars go through workshops, it's not always the case. I'm not saying it's gonna be the case for an M54 because we're talking a lot of power here, um, but I just kinda wanna see how it works. And if this does work, this is gonna be a great option for people doing it at home. Let's just see how it goes. Not making any promises yet, we'll know in the next week or two. Anyway, uh, right, that was the weight. Basically all I did, I didn't grind anything down, I've just paired the heaviest rod and the heaviest pistons, well actually, that's not true. What I did was balance the rod and the piston, but they're all the same anyway, so yeah, it doesn't make any sense. My plan was if one of the pistons was heavier, I'd join the heavier piston with a lighter rod, but it wasn't the case because the pistons were all the same. Again, people that do this properly, people that are charging customers money for this, they'll, wet, they'll, they'll even weigh like the, each end of the rod. And it gets really crazy when you want to do it properly and really expensive. Yeah, and that's probably why Jake's setup is costing three times more than this. We'll see how it goes and we'll see how they compare once they're in the cars. Um, so, ring gaps. Let's get on to that. So, ring gaps. Uh, basically, hopefully, if you're, if you're looking at doing this, you've probably got an idea yet. Actually, this has got a nice little diagram. Um, each piston has three main ring grooves, the top, the second, and the third ring. And luckily, this little thing tells you which one is which because I didn't realize. Just kidding, you can work it out pretty quickly. So the top ring is the main ring, or I like to think of it as the most important ring. It is the hardest of the lot. Something to keep in mind when you are grinding the rings because this one will take more grinding to get the material taken away. And you don't want to take too much away. Second ring, this is a softer material. I couldn't tell you what it's made of. There is a chamfered edge on the bottom side of the piston. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I only work that out because it's the same on the original ones. And then the third ring, which is actually a few rings, is the oil ring. And this one's much less important than the other two. And it's also quite soft. Uh, one of the big issues and the main reason you need to do ring gaps is, obviously, hopefully you can see on here, that's how they sit on the piston. When you've got it in a cylinder, that'll come up really close. And if it gets too hot and the metal expands too much, they will butt up against each other. When they butt up, they will then spread out into the cylinder wall. And I'm fairly confident that's what's happened to my 17T engine. The cylinder's just gotten a little bit too hot. That top ring is butted up and expanded out. And then as it's hit the cylinder wall, it's just cracked the ring land. And it's cracked the ring land between, uh, underneath both piston ring one and piston ring two. And it kind of makes sense. I, I was being a bit of a dick, I guess, and I wanted to believe that the ring lands were cracking because rods were bending, which I've seen quite a few N54s with bent rods when we pulled apart Oh, really, like three of the six rods were bent. I was thinking the rods would bend, twist the piston, crack the ring land. But I think the more I learn about it, the more of you that comment, um, it makes sense that the rings are getting too hot. The factory rings, because the ring gaps are quite small, um, they're getting too hot, they're butting up, and that's what's damaging the ring lands. I'm just very grateful that it hasn't damaged the cylinder walls. I'm hoping it's gonna be the same case with the motor that's in the Flomax car. It was just a, a very short time that that ring was too big. And I guess once it's cracked the ring land anyway, that cylinder loses uh, a lot of its cylinder pressure and then will probably cool down straight away as well. So. Here's to thinking about that. Um, but as I was saying, I've never actually done ring gaps before. I've spoken to quite a few people, not quite a few, I think three or four people that have built N54 engines. Two guys using cheap 
AMPs or Chinese pistons, and a couple of guys that were using brand name pistons. Uh, Jake is using Marl pistons. Interestingly enough, and I should add a little bit of information, the Marl pistons that Jake has bought, which come from VAC Motorsport, they look identical to the Chinese pistons. Uh, I've had them side by side now and I can't tell them apart. Kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, long story short, I'm gonna talk in millimeters for this, but the measurements or the ring gaps that I decided to use were 0.58 mil for the top ring, 0.55 mil for the second ring, and then 0.5 mil for the oil ring. Now, I wasn't sure how important these figures are. Um, the people I spoke to gave me a variance as well. So I kind of had to have a decision. I, I needed to make a decision about what I wanted to do with this. I decided on that until I started doing the ring gaps yesterday when my feeler gauges, and I've got three sets of feeler gauges, but none of them are that accurate. Um, the closest I can get to the measurements I wanted were, I don't know if the GoPro is going to pick it up, but we got 0 0.5, 0 0.55, and then 0 0.6 of a mil. I mean, there's a very, very small difference between the two, but we'll see how important it is. I'm guessing it's not that important because people will run such a variation of ring gaps. The idea is the harder you run the engine, the more power, the more cylinder pressure, the more heat in the cylinder you run, the larger the ring gaps needs to be. Obviously, if you go too big, it won't seal properly and you'll blow a load of smoke uh, because oil will be escaping. But you need to be close to this tolerance. Now, I did the normal thing. I watch YouTube videos. Something I will say, if you're going to attempt this, and if you're watching this video and then you want to go and put your N54 together, go and watch as many of the real street performance engine build videos that you can. Um, all of my knowledge in the automotive industry, all of the engine builders I know, the mechanics I know, Real Street doesn't say anything that contradicts the real world. He does things properly. He does a lot more work than a lot of guys do, but I really like the way he talks about doing stuff and the advice he gives for people doing it at home. He's gonna do a much better job than I am. But yeah, watching Jay's video, something that sort of was ringing in my ear, he said, you're better off going, like we're talking fractionally larger on your ring gaps than fractionally smaller, because if you do cause your rings to butt up, you're gonna have a problem. Now, all the people that I had spoken to about their engine builds with their ring gaps. None of them are currently going as fast as I am. None of them are as fast as my 17T car and none of them are as fast as the Flomax car. So I'm probably already running higher cylinder pressures than those guys. Um, we're a bit silly here, we, we take things to the max. Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. With that in mind as well, I thought maybe I'll go a little bit bigger, also based on my feeler gauge. So what I've ended up doing, my first ring gap, I am just making it so I can just get the 0.6 millimeter feeler in there. So it's super tight. It's not, it's tight. Like you've really got to wriggle it in. Uh, ring number two, I'm going for 0.55. And then my oil rings, I'm setting at 0.50. Now, again, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this and trying to get an understanding of what's going on with ring gaps in a real sense, I measured the ring gaps on cylinder six and cylinder five from these pistons here. And actually I started to lose interest, but on cylinder six, the first ring is 0.28 mil, which is a really small ring gap. Um, I imagine they do that for efficiency. So at lower idle highway cruising, that sort of stuff, you've got a better ring seal, which will make the engine more efficient, I guess, for highway stuff when you're trying to meet emissions targets, that sort of thing. Ring number two was 0.55 mil and then the oil ring was 0.6. So it sort of goes the opposite way to what all the aftermarket companies use. Now the measurements that I'd got from people that have actually had their motors built, uh, which is what I was talking about before, I went through, I think I looked at the JE piston guide and where they use the bore size and then uh, the fuel type and turbo and all that sort of stuff. And there's like a, they've got like a calculation you can use to calculate ring gaps. That also aligns with what the people that I'd spoken to. And it seems that everyone uses a bigger ring gap on one, smaller on two, and smaller on three. That's in the aftermarket world. That's what I've gone with. We'll see if it works in the next week or two. So these are what I've done yesterday. Um, I basically, I was being a bit of a pleb because if I could get the 0.5 mil feeler gauge in and it was a little bit loose, I was sort of guesstimating these figures and I just sort of gave up. But what I've done so far is what I've said. So. We're basically a super tight 0.6 mil on the first ring, a super tight 0.55 mil on the second ring. In fact, some it like you don't even want to force it in. And then the third ring, I haven't really worried about too much. It's around the 0.5. I haven't gone over 0.5, but they're so thin, these oil rings. 
you can sort of twist them a little bit, which you shouldn't do, but you can twist them with the feeler gauges to get whatever measurement you want. Um, Jay from Real Street did say he doesn't normally do much with the oil rings, uh, as long as he's, I think he said as long as they've got 15 thousandths of an inch, whatever that check creates, converts to in millimeters, that's what he does with the oil rings. All right. I'm trying to explain it as I go, but again, go back and watch guys actually know what they're doing. The majority of my engine building research has been real street, Jaffro Mobile. Um, the dude's awesome, actually. I really appreciate what he does with the work that he puts into his YouTube videos. Um, he's been building 4G63s on YouTube for ages. He, he does it like full by the book spec, torque plates. The guy is really good. He's worth watching if you've got time to watch it. Um, but yeah, those two, they're the two channels where I've got most of my sort of high performance engine building information from. Go and check them out. They explain things a lot better than I do. Anyway, let's get into doing these rings. Now, the way I've been doing all of these, I do cylinder, uh, sorry, ring number one first, then ring number two, then ring number three. I've been using the piston that's going to go into that bore to check it. And let's get on with it. I'm going to put you on the stand. So I know the GoPro is not going to be great for this, I do apologise, uh, but we have cylinder one, piston ring one. So it's the top piston ring, it does have top written on it so you know which way up it goes, and all I've been doing is using some oil to lubricate the cylinder. This engine has been cleaned and it's currently full of oil and dust at this point in time, although I've been trying to keep the dust down. I slide the piston ring in. And it goes in pretty easily with your fingertips. And you can see there, it's butted up pretty damn tight. Now to get, to make sure it's sitting at the right point and all level, because obviously if the piston ring is twisted, it won't give you an accurate measurement. I then use the piston. I'm using the piston that is going on that cylinder. My fingers are covered in oil as well, and there's oil in the cylinder, but we will use the piston. And I've been pushing it down to that point there. That's where I've been doing all the measurements. I did do some reading. Some people measure them further down the bore, working on the concept that the bore will be tapered as it comes to the top, but I've just been doing it about that depth there. It is what it is. I figured this area near the top is where all the magic happens. By the time the piston's down the bottom, it's lost cylinder pressure anyway. So that's where I've been measuring it. Now, I'll show you what I did the first time. So that is how these piston rings have been supplied from AMP44, and they measure I uh, can't quite get the feeler gauge in, but they can pretty much they measure just under 0.38 millimeters or 15 hundredths of an inch. I hope that's the right way to do it. And that's pretty much on par with how they've measured with every single one of these bores. What I've been doing is then putting it into my ring filer, which I'll take you over to and show you how I've been making that gap a little bit bigger. All right, so I very professionally just put the ring filer in the vise. That's uh, Oh, and it was a very expensive ring filer from eBay. I think it was about 20 Australian dollars delivered. Um, but from what I can tell, they sort of, whether you spend $20 or 200 they're a very similar device. Something to keep in mind if you're going to be doing this at home, make sure that you file the rings straight. You don't want them on an angle that way, that way, that way, or that way. So you do need to put them in. Make sure the ring is sitting centered. That handle was really tight when I first got this machine, but it's gone all loose now. And I've just been doing it like this. Make sure we sort of butt up both sides at the same time and file it that way. Now, with these top rings, I've been doing 10 turns with, and I'm trying to keep the pressure on the ring the same. And that normally gets me close to where I want it to be. So let's just do that now. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And it's, I've dropped the handle again. <laughs> it's much harder to keep it level when you've got a camera in the way. All right, let's go back to the cylinder and we'll see what that measures up now. Now, as I said before, uh, there are guys that do this properly and will give you much better instruction. Jay from Real Street uh, then goes on to use a jeweler's file to smooth off the edges. Um, however, these particular ones, I don't think they're nitrided like the ones that he's done his demonstration on. Uh, I just basically give them a wipe down. Again, my fingers are nice and oily and put it in and remeasure it. And I'll just make sure the ball still looks nice and oily. So the ring goes in. Use the piston to push it down. And I don't know if it's important, but I've been lining the piston up like it's on a con rod, not that way. 
it'll sit that way once it's in there. Well, it'll sit that way, to be honest. All right, let's see where that gap is now after 10 turns. So we'll go straight to the 0.501. Uh, okay, so 0 0.50 millimeter doesn't quite fit in, which means I've got to go and do some more filing. I'm not going to film the filing again, but what I would do, basically what I'll do, I'll do three turns on the file, we'll bring it back and we'll check it again. You don't want to go too crazy. I did mess up one of the secondary rings and I went basically a step too far. I'm gonna leave it and we'll see how it works. But anyway, I'll go and file it again, three turns and we'll check it. Okay, so I've got it back in there, pushed into spot. We're gonna try with the, I'll try the 0.55 first, 0.50. Oh, actually, just center it again. So that's all level. So this is with another two or, yeah, 0.5s. That's tight, but it's gone in. We'll try 0.55. Oh, it's still a bit, that's too tight to get the 0.55 in. So I've got to do some more filing. I'll be back. And just make sure she's all nice and lubed. And I clean these off every time they come off the filer because I don't want any of the, the ring filings to get in the cylinder. That goes down. And we use a zip piston. Get the ring sitting flat. And I'm feeling good. Let's see if the 0.6 will go in. 0.6 is starting to go in, but it's a bit tight. Let's try 0.55. So yeah, 0.55 has got a little bit of play. 0.6 starts to go in. Oh, that's 0.50. I thought oh, shit, that went in easy. 0.6. That's 0.55. We'll get there in the end. The 0.6 is really tight. Don't know if you can see that. It starts to go in, but it's tight. So that's where I'm gonna leave it. So it's obviously just under 0.6 of a millimeter. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. All right, that's ring number one done. Let's get on to ring number two. And it's the ring number two that caught me out a bit yesterday because they're a bit soft. So again, ring number two, give it a clean, make sure the cylinder's got a nice coating of oil. And I did it with every single one, although it does feel super tedious. We put it in, push it down, and then we measure it again. The reason I measure them to start with is to make sure we're not going to take too much off, just in case there's an anomaly, an anomaly as it comes out the packet. So let's go with a... So I've got a 0.3 of a mil. Let's see if that one will fit in. 0.3 is super tight. Let's try, we'll see if the 0.5 goes in. Oh. 0.5 is, see the 0.5 is starting to slide in. So we don't need to file much off this ring. All right, I'm gonna go and give it two, maybe three turns in the ring filer. Okay, so it's had three turns. Plonk it back in. Tell you what, whatever machine shops charge for this, it's very justified. It is a very time consuming job. Let's see if we can get the 0.55 in. Ooh, yeah, she's in. Tight, but she's in. Hopefully the GoPro can pick that up. All right, so that's ring number two done. And the third ring, the oil ring, is actually made up of two super thin steel rings, I assume they are. Somebody can correct me, whatever they're made of. And then this wafer disc as well. It's only the steel rings, the flat rings that I've been filing down, and they don't take much. I'll just go and run them in the filer quickly, and we'll try and get them to that 0.5 of a mil. All right, that is one of them. We'll slide it in. Slide it down. They're such a thin ring. They're really quite flimsy, and we're going for a 0.5, which is that one. All right, now I might have been a bit brash and taken a bit too much off. That's gone in, but these rings are so soft. Let me see if I can get a 0.5 in. 0.55, sorry. Oh, so many measurements. Not great with math, so I'm not. Okay, so the 0.55 won't go in. So it's, it's a loose 0.5. Happy with that. I did them both at the same time. 
These will both be the same. Let's get them on the piston. Okay, so once we've got the ring gap set, you've got to put the rings, well, the way I've been doing it, I put the rings on the piston. Maybe you're supposed to do it after you've got the rod on, but I just do it this way. Um, the way that I've worked it out, oh, just so you know as well, I have got a light coating. I'm using transmission fluid, which is what Jay from Real Street, my, my new favorite dad does. Um, but the way I put them together, I use the, shit, the wafer ring, which is still open in the engine. And I'm back. So the wafer I put on first, and everything again is cleaned and wiped down with oil. So that's why it looks a bit messy. And you don't want to twist the rings too much. And put the wafer on and butt it up like so. And the wafer sits in there and it's not overlapping. Then I'll put the bottom oil ring on. I don't know why it's easier for me to do it this way, but I'll put the bottom oil on from the bottom of the piston. And trying to bend it as little as possible. And get it to go down in its little hole. Feed that in like that. Get that end in under the wafer. And then that can all go around. So that is the, the wafer which is what I'm going to call it. It's probably not the right name. The wafer and then the bottom oil ring. Then we'll get the top oil ring on. And let's pull it down. Like so. The oil rings are really quite easy to manipulate. And it will just sit on top of the wafer and then work its way. In fact, it's just fallen in. Okay, so that is the oil ring in place. Now the secondary ring, although it's softer than the top one, it's still quite hard compared to the oil ring. And my spring compressor, not spring, spring, hang on, my ring grinding tool come with a spring opener thingy my bob. So we can use that to get it just over the piston. I'm trying to do it with as little stretch as possible. Okay, and what you do wanna watch is these will scratch the piston. So we try and be as careful as we can. That is the secondary ring down in its groove, like so. And then the top ring. And again, everything's covered in oil and cleaned, but it probably doesn't look clean on camera. And again, these do have to go up a certain way, but they do say top. And then we get the top one on. And get it down into its hole. And that's the top ring on. All right, now give it a wipe down with a lint-free cloth. And that is a piston with the rings on there. Now the next step is to get it on the rod, which is harder than I thought it would be. In fact, we'll just keep it going on a one take. Might change the angle a little bit. I'm trying to work with a bit of a dodgy light here, but we'll see how we go. Um, that piece of paper can now go. So wrist pin, rod, and piston. I The first one that I actually did, I coated this in transmission fluid and the tolerance is so tight, I wouldn't actually try and slide it through there without lubricant. I'm using assembly lube. Some people say use assembly lube. Some people say use oil. I don't know. Does it matter? I like the assembly lube because it's a bit thicker and it will leave a film on there, which I'm sure will get dissolved once it does a couple of heat cycles. But what I've been doing is wrist pin lubed heavily. However, you'll see when I slide the, the wrist pin through the piston, it all comes off anyway. And I've got lube on my finger. So we'll put that in the actual piston as well. 
So all the surfaces are well coated with assembly lube. Everything's super slippery. Luckily you can just use your little finger like this. And that is how tight the tolerance is. And you can see there, the wrist pin sort of cleaned off perfectly. What I'm just gonna do is just make sure we got a nice film in there. Yeah, we do. So the wrist pin goes in and I can't remember which channel I got this little tip from, but getting the wire locks in is bloody tight. You're gonna see me struggle in a second, but basically you put it in and then you use a bulldog clip like this. So it just goes in there like that. And then you can push the wrist pin down the reason that's important is when you try and if you try and put one of these in without the wrist pin in there, it's very easy to slip and then damage the surface that the wrist pin is going to slide on. So let's put that one in. And of course, you've got the rings hanging out. Your fingers are covered in this really slippery thing. Try and put it around there. So that goes like that. And then I'm using just a small screwdriver. Didn't get it in. Story of my life. Oh, popped out. I knew this was going to be hard to do on camera. And luckily I left it to the last one, so I can't like just film the best one. I'll show you the best one that I filmed. This is the only one I've filmed. So it will without doubt be the hardest to get in, I guess. Okay, so we get that in as much as we can. We'll get the screwdriver over here and just see if we can get it to come in. Oh my God, the force on it is crazy. Okay, so the circlip's nearly in, or the wire lock, whatever it's called. Let's push it down. Hey, it locked in. Huh, the one I filmed was one of the easy ones. Okay, so when we've got that one in, that's now gonna stop the wrist pin from coming out this way. So we can take the bulldog clip out like so, push the wrist pin back through a bit. You see how clean it's gone? All the lube is gone. Get it to there. And I'm just making sure I've got all the pistons around the same way. So I want it to go that way. And we've got the rod, which needs to go in. Again, let's put some assembly lube on the rod. Or in the rod. Nice and messy. And actually, that's there. I want the piston to go that way. Hopefully the camera's getting this. Yes, it is. So the rod goes in and everything has to be perfectly aligned. If the rod's not straight, the piston ring won't go through. Okay, that's, that's lube. We've got a lot of lube. So I might just put a little bit more on that side there. Okay, piston on, get it level. Try and show you guys. Okay, wrist pin is through. That's now joined and now we've got to get the wire lock in on this side. Let's see how we go. The last one. God, these things are tight. And not tight like a good tight. Pain in the ass tight. And that one's gone in as well. I swear to God, those two were the two easiest that I've done. They're both seated perfectly as well. All right. I've got to say, the way that, like, I haven't pulled many engines apart. I really, and this one's now the only two N54s, but these just feel so good. There is no play. Everything is nice. There's no restriction either. Like, it wobbles. It's, it's spinning freely, but there's no play. It just feels great. Unlike these, which feel like they have play. They're loose. They are used and had a way more power put through them than they were ever intended. All right, so now I just give it a clean up. And what do we do next? Okay, so moving forwards, I've actually 
Um, what's the right way to word this? So what I've done at this point in time, I have locked the crank with my vice grips just here on both sides to stop it from spinning. And what we're going to do is check the bearing clearances. So I, I actually filmed two intros to this video and I'm not sure one of them errored. So I'm not sure which one's going to work, but, and I can't remember which one I mentioned it, but I have ended up with the ACL bearing extra clearances, not the standard clearance. Now, from what I can understand of what I've read, the ACL extra clearance is the same size bearing as the King bearings, but it all gets a bit weird because if you look at doing the rod bearings on an N54, the BMW spec way, they will have different bearings across the, the journals. Now the reason that they run different rod bearings or different size bearings or different clearances is to ensure that oil pressure is consistent across all of the journals, and that is the main reason that we have rod bearing clearances. It's to allow the film of oil to be the right size and also allow the engine to build oil pressure. If you have a tighter gap on all of your bearings, the oil pressure in the motor is going to be higher than if you have a bigger gap. And traditionally with race engines, that's how they'll tune them. They'll actually tune oil pressure with rod bearing clearance. Now, I've gone, I wanted to use the extra clearance ones if we can get basically the tolerance in spec with what I've read. And I'm going to have to bring those numbers up or I'll flash them up on the screen now. Uh, I'll, I'll have to research them in a second. But basically, uh, even if this is on the outer limits of the acceptable N54 clearance, I'm going to run it. And even if it's a little bit over, I'm going to run it because we do run our N54s on 10W60, not the 540 they normally run on. Uh, the thing that does get a bit dodgy is we've got standard mains. However, the mains are worn. Oh, well, they're not worn, but they're used. So I would expect the main bearing clearance to be higher than new, and hopefully with some extra clearance rod bearings and everything being new on the rod bearing side, we're going to end up with similar oil clearances across both the mains and the rods. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, this is so out of whack and so far from what you should do. Who knows? Now, also, I can't remember which intro I've got it on, but the proper way to do this is with a micrometer and a bore gauge and you actually measure the crank journal and then you measure the gap inside the rod and then obviously you can calculate the rod bearing clearance. Um, unfortunately I don't have a micrometer and I think the cost of getting a good micrometer, not a China one, um, it just sort of outweighs it for guys that are going to DIY this and maybe build one motor in their entire life. So I'm relying on the trusty plastic gauge, and depending on what intro it is. Um, a lot of people use this. All of the, pretty much everyone that does the S65 or S85 rod bearings, they verify the rod bearing clearance with plastic gauge. It's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is with a micrometer, but hey, we're doing a budget build. So basically what I've got now, the crank is locked so that it won't spin when I turn it over. I've cleaned the journals. The bearings are dry, so we don't want it to turn over whilst the bearing is dry, but it's important to keep it dry to do well, for the plastic gauge to work. Um, now this plastic gauge is the green type and it should give us a measurement between 0 0.025 millimeters, hopefully you can see it, and 0.76 millimeters. The bearing clearance that I think is acceptable for the N54 is 0 0.045 up to 0 0.07. So basically we want to be in this range here. So let's put a bit on the rod cap just broken a small bit off, we'll lay it down in the rod, make sure we get the cap around the right way, Ugh. and one thing that I have found with these max speeding rods, the this little sleeve for the rod cap makes it bloody tight to get in and out. Anyway, I'll stop complaining, keep it in the right spot, and one rod bearing. I have put a little bit of oil on the, sorry, not rod bearing, rod bolt, on the rod bolt just to help the threads. Oh, I hope that didn't move it. Hey, I'm even going to do it with this because why not? Make it a bit quicker and I won't actually tighten it with that. I'll tighten it by hand. So I'm going to go hand tight. Now these are the Max Speeding Rods ARP rod bolts. The ARP rod bolts, from what I understand, you're supposed to torque them to 20 foot-pounds and then 50 foot-pounds. So let's do that. I've borrowed a torque wrench, a snazzy snap-on torque wrench. Thank you, Jake. And the torque wrench is currently set to 50 foot-pounds, but I'll be able to look at it and I'll do it to 20 and then 50. Okay.
That's 20. I probably should need be a little bit more of a smoother movement. So I actually went to 22. Let me just let it reset. Which it should reset as soon as I move it. Okay, that went to about 25. I'll go back to the other one. I'm going to go to 50. And it'll beep this time. 50. And then 50. I went a bit far. 52. That's right, it'll handle the extra horsepower. Okay, so that's it actually torqued down. Now I just got to remove it. And, ooh, it's tight. And we'll see what that plastic gauge looks like. Yeah, I'll do it by. So that's one rod bolt. I should keep that. In a certain spot, so I know what side it was. That's the second one. Now, again, with those sleeves on the cap, it does make it quite difficult to get off. I actually hammered them off. I put them in the vise and knocked it off with a hammer before. It's coming off a bit easier. Hey, all right, she's off. Okay, we can see the plastic gauge across that, and I'll bring you in for a close-up of the plastic gauge on the crank. Hopefully you can see that. I'll probably just, I'll, I'll overlay a photo, but where's my ruler? Okay, so if we use the plastic gauge there, that is, it's a bigger clearance than we'd probably like, but it's between, ooh, okay, it's bigger than 0.76, so it's between 0.64 and 0.76. But it's not consistent across the whole journal, which is interesting. I wonder why that is. All right, so I've actually, it's been about an hour since that last clip, and I wanted to speak to a couple of people that are a bit more experienced in plastic gauge, rod bearings, etc., and just make sure I wasn't gonna be wasting my time assembling the rest of this. Uh, just so that everybody knows, basically the thinner the plastic gauge appears on the journal is the thicker the bearing clearance is. So the small line means it's got a 0.76 and a big line means it's a 0.025 millimeter. Now what we are there is, I'm gonna say it's around 0.5, no that's not right, it's between 0.5 and 0.65 across the plastic gauge, for some reason, it's not gone perfectly flat. I don't know why, sometimes it happens like that, apparently. But, general consensus, we're safe to send it. Now I will flash up the, I've, I've got a screenshot, which I've already forgotten about. Let me open it up quickly. Da, 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 da. Where are we? Here we go. So just to confirm, acceptable standard rod clearance, rod bearing clearance, for an N54, is 0 0.048 millimeter to 0 0.071. Now that's when you're running five weight 30, the recommended oil. I'm running a thicker oil, so we can assume that it would be safe to go slightly higher than that. Um, but we're within that tolerance. We're around that 0 0.06, let's say. So I'm happy with that. I'm gonna get the rest of them checked and put together. Uh, GoPro's about to go flat. I might try and time lapse it. In the meantime, I'm going to turn the music up and get the rest of this engine put together and I'll give you a summary at the end and make sure it all rotates okay. <laughs> all right, see you shortly. Oh, and actually, now that we know that we are safe to go ahead with this one, all I'm going to do is put assembly lube on both sides of the rod bearing, so on the top and the lower section, clean the plastic gauge off and torque it up for real. Hopefully it never has to come undone again.
GoPro has gone flat, which is awesome. Uh, but I thought whilst we've got those two in, uh, and tolerance or sorry clearance on cylinder six was sweet as well uh we've got it at top dead center and she is flush not sticking out which i was a little bit worried about the piston or rod or anything being out of spec but we're pretty good also i have checked clearance to the oil squirters actually let me go to the light it was something that was a bit of a concern with aftermarket pistons yeah these amp pistons do not touch the oil squirters so we are good. In fact, I might just turn it over on camera. I've got to hope the timing chain doesn't get uh, caught up, but it turns over quite nicely. There we go. Everything is coated in oil. I'm not sure how I'm going to clean it yet before it goes together. All right. I'm gonna crack on, do the other four, and I will give you an update when that's done, because I'm running out of time. All right, I'm kind of enjoying this. All right, guys, speak to you soon. All right, so I've got it on a power lead at the moment, so sorry about the silly angle, but I just thought I'd show you how I've actually been getting the pistons in. Um, I'm just gonna put a little bit more on this one, but a little bit of oil goes on, and try and work it all the way into all the rings so that the rings have no reason to bind up, um, because, I don't have all the right tools. I'm just using one of these cheap piston ring compressors, whatever they're called. So that goes on like that. And then we start clamping it. It just, it feels terrible. I've already cut myself twice on it, but it's doing the job. Okay, so we get it like that. Try and make sure that the piston is sitting in that fairly on the right angle, it's not twisted or anything. And I think we're good. Then already load the top rod bearing in just because it's easy to put in while it's at the top. Make sure it's going around the same way. Don't know if it matters, but I've got them all facing the same way. Then basically get it down like that. So the piston is just in the cylinder and we'll tighten this up again. That's as tight as I can get it. And we'll give it a bit of a tap. Now I've seen people tap these on videos, but it makes a huge difference that it's down perfectly flush. And then we give the piston a tap. That's it, that is the piston in the bore. And I'll tap it all the way down so it's on the rock, on the crank. I've got a nice thud to let us know that it's on the crank. Right, just thought I'd show you guys that. We've got some charge, they're all in. Okay, so all of the clearances were pretty good. Um, in fact, let me flash up cylinder six, cylinder five, cylinder four, cylinder three, which was a bit dodgy, cylinder two, cylinder one. It was cylinder four that was dodgy. But the, um, the only one that actually concerned me was cylinder two. And you can see there it is pretty close to the 0 .007 millimeter Clearance, which is at the top end of like the allowable clearance that an M54 should have with standard oil. Don't forget we're gonna be running thicker oil, so I'm not too stressed. Um, but yeah, it's all gone together pretty well. It's full of just oil everywhere, just to keep everything lubricated. But one thing I have noticed with these, they sit perfectly flush. Like when I had the other pistons in here, they, were, they weren't level left to right. These all feel mint, I've actually checked all four. Have a listen to it turning over. All you can hear is the timing chain, to be honest. Everything feels great. So I'm feeling pretty good at this point right now. Feeling pretty damn good. Now, you guys will probably think, well, that's a funny thing to say considering how bodgy I've done it. But what I'll end this video off with, right now, these rods and pistons are more balanced than the ones that come out of it. That is correct. Even though they're not balanced perfectly, these are better balanced than the ones that were in there. I can't remember if I said at the start of the video, I intended on showing you guys weighing every single rod and piston that's in there at the moment. Um, there is two grams in total. So from the lightest rod and piston to the heaviest rod and piston, there is a two gram variance. 
Now, again, I don't have the most accurate scale, so that could be 1.6 grams, um, but that's significantly different to the five gram variant that was in it. These rod and piston combos, even though they are a heavier duty, they're actually about 40 grams lighter than the factory ones. So we're better balanced, we're stronger, we're lighter, I didn't check the bearing clearances. Well, I could have plastic aged the old ones, but I didn't really, I couldn't be bothered. Um, but we have still, we are still within tolerance. Assuming plastic gauge is to be believed, which most people seem to think it is, we are within spec for factory oil. I'm gonna run some thick oil. I think we're gonna be pretty safe. Um, the other thing to note, we also have larger ring gaps than standard pistons. Well, a larger first ring gap, the second ring gap's pretty similar, and the third ring gap's a little bit bigger. So I kind of feel like we're gonna be able to make some more power, safer, which is all we want. It's all I want. I wanna be able to run like 800 wheel horsepower and not blow it up straight away. Get a gear out of it, that'd be good. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, basically I'd like to run it at the power level that we cooked, that we blew it up at, but be able to brake boost at low RPM and still be pretty safe, which I think is gonna be the case. These rods look beefy. If we go much higher than what I'm thinking, you're gonna start having issues with walls flexing and that sort of stuff. But I think we should be good. We've got a lighter rotating assembly that's better balanced with better piston ring clearances and it's stronger than what was in there. It's gotta be a win. So I'm gonna call this a success at this point in time. Uh, I still need to put all of that back on the block. Actually, well, with new gaskets, obviously. Um, but I'll get onto that tomorrow. I'll go and get this video edited. If you've got any questions, let me know below. I've tried to not talk about anything that I'm not certain on. I will say that. Uh, again, this is the first engine I've put together. I've tried to show you what I'm doing, but not necessarily how to do it. Again, go and watch some real street videos if you're going to have a crack at doing this yourself. Um, even though you can do it differently to how he does it, he just knows what he's talking about, Mr. J. Um, yeah, but... Now it's all here and rotating. I'm really happy with it. It looks good. Nothing, there's been no issues with binding. Oh, the only thing that I will note that I learned, there's something I learned today. I actually, well, worked out. When you put your new rod and piston in, make sure that it is in the middle, not off to the side. Gotta be in the middle. Like these flop around because they're worn out. But those ones, even with the assembly lube on them, um, they are quite tight and it does get difficult to slide onto the conrod, sorry, the crank journal if uh, when they were off a little bit, but if I centered them as they went down in the hole, they went super smooth, super easy. I think that was it. Assembly lube is on all the bearing surfaces, on the wrist pin, and then there's oil everywhere else. I'm gonna cover it up, hopefully get the head on it tomorrow. Then we're gonna get the engine out of the Flomax car and get this Lamex setup. The Lamex setup has arrived. Let me know if you would like to see a video on this stuff going back on, which we have already done on the channel for the original 17T engine swap, or if you would prefer to see a video of the Lamet controller unboxing next. Um, yeah, this is all gonna be pretty standard stuff that we've already covered before, and I really wanna go through that Lamet stuff, so let me know what you wanna do, but I will definitely get this put back on the engine tomorrow. I hope. Guys, thank you for watching. It's all going pretty well. Yeah, the max speeding rods, the AMP 44 pistons, no issues with them at this point. All looks pretty safe. We'll catch you on the next one.